Welcome back to the Red Letter Disciple. I am Zach Zender, and in a couple of minutes, Chris Johnson, my co-host, is going to join me. And I hope that this podcast is challenging you to be a greater disciple of Jesus wherever you are. I, I really want to see a greater, fuller, and truer expression of Jesus in this world, and it's possible. And man, if the world could see that, how much would it change? That's what I hope we get to see. So on this episode, you will be challenged, you will be inspired, and I think you're going to have a lot of laughs along the way with us. Episode seven today features Katie Cole. <laughs> Man, we had a lot of fun talking to Katie. She is so smart, like super, super smart. Katie is a speaker, a writer, a leadership guru. She's worked in the church for the past two decades. She is like one of the incredible experts in the church multi-site movement. She brings an incredible perspective on developing and growing leaders, especially female leaders. And so I know in the church world, like we've got lots of room for growth in that area. So not only is it like an important conversation, but it's going to be fun. Katie's going to help Chris solve a Scrabble debate that he's had for like three years with his friends. And she's a self-proclaimed lover of potlucks. So like, what, what do you bring? What's the best and worst foods to bring? She's got some pretty strong opinions on that. So you're going to hear from her in a couple of minutes. But first, I promised a big announcement last week. And rather than making you wait all the way to the end, I'm just going to give it to you now. And here it is. Because of the support of of all of you listeners and of our sponsor, The Giving Church, all the ratings and reviews that you've gone to help to bat for us, we are now officially going to have a season two. Yay! Come on, somebody. That's right. Season one is 12 episodes. We're just in the middle of season one still. Don't worry. We got six more in this season. And if you've missed any of those episodes or want to access any of the show notes or stay updated, you can do that at redletterpodcast.com. But season two, we're going to pick up right where we left off, and we're hopefully going to keep coming back Tuesday after Tuesday after Tuesday for as long as we can be helpful. It was reviews like the one by ACBFDSFJY. That's a pretty nice name there. <laughs> that said, an absolute smorgasbord of humor, biblical truth, challenges, and faith-filled fun. Can't wait to hear and watch these episodes. Reviews like that mean the world to us. And so if you haven't yet, throw a five-star review our way, please, would you, on your favorite streaming platform and share the episodes on social media. And hey, as we're seeking out our guest list, who would you like to hear from? Like what, what world-class disciples does the world need to hear from? Let us know. You can go to redletterpodcast.com and contact us there. So the fact, again, that we're having a season two is not only thanks to you, but a huge shout out to our season one sponsor, The Giving Church. Their team has helped raise more more than a billion dollars at a thousand different churches. And so if you need to raise capital, they are the ones to help. And things, I know you've seen this, they've changed quite a bit in the past couple of years, which leaves me wondering, and maybe you're wondering this question too, as a pastor, like, even if I did need to raise funds for a kingdom vision, is now like a good time for that? So I wanted to bring on Phil Ling, the founder and leader of The Giving Church to answer that question. So Phil, even if I wanted to, is raising funds for a kingdom vision or a capital campaign right now a good thing to do? Well, as I have told my son when he was growing up, my humble but accurate opinion. So my humble but accurate opinion is there's never been a more demanding time for this. You're coming out of a time when, especially in North America, we were told for two years that the church was non-essential. Their, their phrase, not mine, they, we are non-essential. So now you're coming back. It's not just a matter of reopening. It's why do you exist? What are you trying to accomplish? And so as you re-sharpen the vision, you also have to refuel the vision, and that's the generosity. And so how do you challenge? How do you bring people alongside and broaden the base of participation to accomplish the vision you're laying out? I like that. I'm going to use your phrase, humble but accurate opinion as well in my, <laughs> in my life. And I think that's awesome. And I'm totally on board with you. I, I really think that, yes, there's been major disruption, but that leaves incredible opportunity for us. And, and you've heard, if you've been listening to this podcast or reading anything from me, like I'm all about like, let's as the church play offense, not defense. 
the world needs Christ even more so. And and I think it's really the churches that play offense and have the new vision and raise them, that, that go for it, that are going to see really great kingdom f- dreams come to fruition. And so I hope Phil and his team at The Giving Church can help your church. If you're thinking about, is now the right time to raise funds? Like they would love to talk with you. And so you can access them and find their information at thegivingchurch.com slash red. Um, not only can you learn more about who they are there, but they want to give you a free gift because they're giving as well. Uh, the free gift that's going to help your church grow. And, and so you can check that out at thegivingchurch.com slash red. Without further ado, episode seven, Katie Cole. Let's do this. All right. Well, we got a great show today. We're bringing an incredible guest, Katie Cole, onto the show with us. Katie is an engaging, practical, and down-to-earth speaker. Uh, She's an author. She's written on a whole lot of things, leadership, uh, organizational development, spiritual growth, uh, and how to live a full life, which I, I love that. Uh, she is uh, right now living in sunny Florida. Chris, that's where you're coming from, but our podcast is recorded in Nebraska. And snowing in God's Nebraska. Country. <laughs> and uh, Katie, it says here in your bio that you love garage sales, intense, intense Scrabble games. We're going to come back to that. Home do-it-yourself projects and potluck dinners with friends. Oh, man, I got so many questions. So we got to start with a couple questions right there at the end of your bio. Uh, I know Chris and I each have something we want to ask. Yes. So do you want to start with Scrabble? Well, I mean, the, the discipleship is super important. <laughs> it is. Uh, it is. But once I read your bio and I realized, Katie, that you are a Scrabble expert, um, I needed some clarification. And let me just start right from the beginning. This has been kind of an ongoing issue that I've had with my best friend. And he's a nurse uh, practitioner and my really good friend. She's my dentist. And so right off the bat, I've been a pastor for uh, about 19 years. They're way smarter than I am. And I always lose at Scrabble. And, but we always play Scrabble. And, and so about a month ago, Katie, um, I had them for the first time ever. I have one letter left. That letter, Katie, Z. Ooh. I have a Z. That's and a I one. notice that there's an opening at the bottom or at the top. And right above the A is a triple Ooh, word score. If I put that Z above that A, I win this game. I do it. I take my Scrabble. And I'm at this point, I'm a little arrogant because I've defeated people who are way smarter than me. I put the Z and I spell za. They immediately said, that is not a word. And you will remove that Z right now. Yeah. And tempers started to flare because I I think that's a pretty good play. 31 points. I beat them. And still to this day, they don't let me live it down. And they claim that it was not a victory. So we're solving this right now. With I am going to record this moment <laughs> and send it based on your answer. Or we will delete this entire portion of the podcast. Katie, can I get a ruling? Well, I got to tell you, this is probably one of the most controversial words in Scrabble. Like this will bring the debate out as much as uh, I navigate women in leadership. This is like a close second to the intensity of this conversation. And in all my years of Scrabble playing, I would say uh, this is a split decision. There are about half the people I play with approve it and don't. But I personally love the word za. I use it all the time. So I am with you on this one. Absolutely. You are the winner. (laughs) <laughs> All right, guys. Great podcast. Thanks, Wait, that's Katie. it for you? <laughs> oh, See, we're just helping one person at a time here. All right. And so, hey, what's the, when you see this, what's the letter you want to see most when you're playing Scrabble? Oh, you're, I love getting a Q. Q. There you go. Yeah, but yeah you, big you score, would... big points. You don't because they're my I... two favorite words, right? Q-A-T and Q-I, what which they sneak in. Q-A-T, it's some sort of like shrubbery um, or like some sort of Arabian bush or something like that. Um, yeah, and totally. QI is an approved Scrabble world. And so we, I love that, especially if you get it early in the game, because you can look for the opportunity like you did with your Z and get high points return on that. I can't, t- I got to tell you, this is such a relief that you've brought to me because they have chastised me for literally a month that I'm some kind of dopey, guy with a and limited you're, education you're actually super smart okay since you're a word person i assume are you are you wordle 
Oh, yes. Okay. Yep. I, I was on Wordle before it was like really known, which makes me uh, just feel extra special. But well, yeah, I did get a Wordle back? in uh, in my second, uh, like my second try. That's my best Wordle so far. I haven't nailed it on the first one yet, but I did get one by the second line. What's your starting mm-hmm. word for Wordle? I usually use uh, Earth, E-A-R-T-H, because okay. it gets two vowels and the three most common letters of, yeah, that are used in words. I'm going to do Eliminates well. a lot. All right, so you helped Chris. You got to help me first, and then we're going to help our entire audience. Yes, okay. this is all about help. Because it says you love potlucks. I don't know mm. if you know this, Katie, but I actually— <laughs> I in- sound like the biggest nerd from some small no. church in Montana, which is absolutely who I am. I'm glad I am consistent with who I am. <laughs> no, you are helping each of us yes. in a big way. Yes. Because I have a little bit of a uh, averse reaction to potlucks right now because Tell her. I attempted in 2015 to break a Guinness World Record for the largest potluck ever. Uh, with my church and yeah. uh, it was like 1800 people in India oh. and we went for it and it was a great day. We raised a lot of money for a food pantry over $30,000, but we fell short and didn't break the record. Well, let me, we let only me, had 1200 people there. Let me, let me rewind for a second because uh, Zach was on a bit of a hot streak, Katie, because he broke the world record for the longest speech, which was 43 hours, No, 53, 53 oh, sure. hours. And he preached through the entire Bible. So then I don't wow. want to say this, but kind of, and then he thought he could break any world record. So he's like, he's on a hot streak. He's got a hot hand. He says, yeah. let's do the world's largest potluck. And it did not come out and still got a bitter taste in his mouth. Yeah. Not from the potato salads that showed up, but from the lack of being able to can, do it. Can I tell you one other thing about potlucks that as a pastor is hard mm. is, you know, we have a lot of potluck lunches early on mm. in the life of our church. Mm-hmm. And they're meant to be fun community events. But because I'm a pastor, I have to serve and go last. And like by the time <laughs> by the time I get to eat, all the good stuff is gone. Yeah. And so it's gone. Katie, tell me why I should like potlucks and then what the go-to dish is at the potluck. Those are Well, I just want to acknowledge the Guinness Book of World Records here. This is super impressive. And from my leadership development mindset, I think what you really ran into is just you took a step of leadership. You went from controlling it all yourself to delegating. It's always a big hurdle. Takes practice. You got to do a couple rounds. Mm -hmm. Be a little nicer to yourself. Go for it again. You learn some things. It's not easy to multiply yourself. And you did a great job. So I think you got to go for it one more time. <laughs> so wait a second. That's a really good Thank point. You, when the world record depended on Zach, he was able to push through yep. and do it. When the world record depended on tons of volunteers and people coming in, that was a different aspect. So maybe this is why leaders get stuck in their leadership because they feel like a failure when really it's way more of a success. This wow, is the most right compelling Katie, you're podcast amazing. of all time. <laughs> yes. All right. All right. I love it. And so, yeah, what is that go-to potluck dish for you, though? I yeah, got to know that. Let's and then know we're that. jumping into it. Oh, I, got, I mean, you can't go wrong with mac and cheese. Mac and cheese and Rice Krispie snacks, which are, I, I come by this very honestly. I have tried to be super impressive. I got like salads with mixed fruits in them and homemade dressings. And I've tried like really fancy things. But Wait. the two things that go that everyone loves, mm-hmm. craft box mac and cheese and Rice Krispie treats, they're a winner every time. They're the yep. first thing to go. I just don't stray from it anymore. You heard it here first, folks. And, I love it. And I will also add to that, my go-to is the $1.99 like generic uh, brownie mix. Those things are good. Oh, yes. Yeah. I think the only real big fail is like the bag of tortilla chips and like the, the you know, the grocery store cookies. I'm like, at least choose yeah. something that's got like something a little bit in it. Um, so that's my only, because that's- the problem is you get 40 bags of chips and like two dishes. That's today's world of potluck. So yep. yeah, Katie, it takes a little bit more strategy. Chris, you have helped me. Uh, so far. And so we are incredibly selfish to spend the first 10 minutes on us. So let's, let's think about our audience and all those listening. We got a lot of people, church leaders, and also those that are just every day living the Christian faith. And so you are a leadership expert, and I appreciate that about you. I, I want to talk about leadership and discipleship. Do you see these two going hand in hand, or how do they work together, similar or different? Yeah, so I think leadership and, uh, or excuse me, discipleship and leadership development do go hand in hand, but they are not the same thing. And the way I like to describe it is there is a discipleship bucket and a leadership bucket. And one of the challenges is when we morph them into the same thing, which happens a lot of times in our churches, and especially for those of us who have worked on a church staff, they feel... uh, 
interconnected because for most of us, they have been in our own experience when you have leadership gifts because part of discipleship is identifying your giftedness and living that out, particularly in kingdom and ministry environments. Um, but leadership really sits on top of the discipleship bucket. You can't be a leader if you haven't first been a disciple. Cool. Uh, and a lot of times we over promote people based on talent or ability or personality, or we just like them or they look good or they whatever reason we have. And we we miss the foundation. And that's where we get some really bad leadership uh, experiences. But I like to think of them as two separate buckets uh, because in discipleship, we are all equal. We all need grace. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. We're all disciples. The care and love we give is without uh, uh, like discrimination. It's without uh, even really needing to inspect someone's life. There's just a whole bunch of freedom. And like our weekend services are discipleship oriented. Everybody gets to come. Everybody gets to participate. Leadership is different. In scripture, we have qualifications for it. We can actually lose the ability to lead. You can never lose the ability to be a disciple. You will always be one. And we get into trouble in leadership when we ascribe discipleship values to leadership bucket okay. and when we put leadership buckets into our discipleship programs. And so wow. keeping them separate, different standards, different values, approaching leaders different, holding them accountable differently, uh, even how we view ourselves as both of those people. I am both a disciple who participates in my church and a leader who guides my church, different rules, different expectations and different needs that I need to give myself. As someone who has um, a boatload of charisma and limited intelligence, I can appreciate what you just said because I've been able to rise through the ranks because of that. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering how you've risen through the ranks, but yeah, yeah. Um, no. So that's so great. So when you have someone who, like, what what's the what's the step then that you would how would you start them in a discipleship? bucket mm -hmm. and what does that look like? And then when does someone make the jump or is it, yeah, talk to me about when, when that happens yeah. into the leadership bucket. Yeah. Well, I, there's two parts of leadership, right? There's spiritual leadership and there is organizational leadership. And uh, spiritual leadership is part of what the fruit of a mature disciple is. We start reproducing ourselves spiritually. We start having wisdom and guidance for other people. We have a heart for those who haven't learned what we've learned yet. And so we naturally have an overflow of fruit that happens. That's spiritual leadership. And every believer has the authority to have that. Yeah. Uh, organizational leadership is different. That's where we actually have standards and requirements that as church leaders, we have to uphold. And as a participant and a member of my church, I have to apply for those opportunities or I need to be asked into those opportunities. They aren't automatic and they're not things I can give myself. Someone else owns that authority and they have to loan it to me for as long as I steward it well, and they can take it back at any time. And so I think knowing the difference between those two, um, I see a lot of uh, disciples feel like they have no authority and they live uh, really ineffective, spiritually um, not fruitful lives because they don't know how to step into the authority that Jesus gives them as a believer. Yeah. And we find a lot of leaders who double down on organizational authority because they aren't sure how to steward it for the benefit of the kingdom, because yeah. servant leadership is what's required in those organizational roles. Yeah. And I think sometimes I've seen this and maybe you have too, of it's sometimes easy. We're both pastors. So we're on church staff. So we understand ministry and it's sometimes easy for us to elevate church ministry positions and, and to kind of in a vacuum think this is what it's all about this, but it's not. And that's part of what this podcast is. Like we want to talk to church mm -hmm. leaders, those that are in ministry, but we also know that a lot, most people won't be. And, and so uh, I think sometimes we do a disservice to them if we're not allowing them to be and, and grow as the disciples that they are in the workplaces or the spaces that they're in that we can't get to. And so what would you say to someone who maybe God's not calling to church ministry, but man, they're a powerful disciple mm -hmm. uh, of, of Jesus in the workplace or uh, somewhere else out there? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, I write and speak a lot about uh, female leadership. And I would say this is almost universally the experience of women who have leadership gifts is they aren't often invited into formalized leadership roles. And so they tend to use their leadership in more organic and spiritually influential ways outside the church. Um, it also kind of points to that kind of culture of having a higher calling that really isn't in scripture, but pastors love to think of themselves that way. And it, we do do a disservice when we don't help people know that the higher calling is 
actually following Jesus. It's not yeah. your career yeah. path. Yeah. And God calls people to be surgeons and business owners and government leaders and teachers and everything else that's as clear of a calling as uh, deciding to work in church. Uh, and we have to honor both of those. Our job is, as church leaders, as spiritual leaders, is to help everyone hear God's voice, identify their calling, and pursue it with everything they have and with great sacrifice, wherever that takes them. If, yeah. we're, if we're really only concerned about building our volunteer teams or helping us reach our career goals, We've kind of missed the point of what the body is really supposed to be functioning as. So well said and so succinctly said. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I love it. So on the on the framework, and I, I agree, like the the overall church can definitely be very male centric at times. And you talk a lot about uh, the importance of developing females. Uh, what are a couple of of key things that you coach and teach when it comes to how to develop? Uh, females in church and leadership and, mm -hmm. and beyond. Sure. One of my favorite points to make is that this is really not a theological issue as much as it is a practical leadership issue. And part of the research I did for my book was to really survey churches who were doing a good job developing female leaders. And what we found surprisingly to me and to the team and to most of the people I talked to is theology really didn't play nearly as big of a role as we thought it would. It kind of feels like there's two camps or two choices. You're either like for women to be leaders or against them. And uh, it isn't that way at all, especially I'm from a very conservative background. And uh, that always felt very limiting to me. And uh, I've had opportunities to lead in really great ways in churches. And so I try to take the theological issue off the table and instead look at what is your theology and how well are you living it out in your church? Uh, because we found very conservative, theologically conservative churches where women were leading at all levels of the church, including the executive team. And we found very progressive or egalitarian churches where there were no women hardly leading in leadership roles and definitely no one in upper level leadership. So the theology made very little difference. What made the difference is we knew what our theology was and we were living it out throughout the whole culture. So uh, in those more progressive or egalitarian environments, it was easy to say we believe in women, but it was also easy to never actually put them in roles of leadership. And so that distance, that kind of um, space, and we find this in all theological aspects of churches when we believe one thing, but we do something else. And so that's the first thing I usually try and encourage people is it doesn't really matter what your theology is. It matters that you articulate it and you're making sure that everyone's living it out and we're all aligned and on the same page. And then the second thing is to remember that most women at your church didn't grow up in your church. They have they come from different backgrounds and the kind of women you want to recruit to be leaders, spiritually mature women, uh, women who are a little bit more seasoned. We're not talking about like a really energetic 19 year old girl who accepted Christ a year ago. We're talking about, you know, women who have been around the block, who know your church, who have been proven in ministry. People already are following her. These are women who grew up in environments that were pretty um, strong about women's roles. And it doesn't really matter what church environment um, our culture was like that for the last 30 years or so. And so we know that this is an issue and we're hesitant to leave lead fully into the invitation you want to give us to lead. And so part of what particularly men leaders can do is really articulate to women, where are you welcome to serve at? We want you to be small group leaders. We want you to pray out loud in front of men. We want you to take the lead. We want to hear your ideas. We want you to be on staff. You have to say it because godly women will assume they are not welcome unless you articulate it. And that that's where we're missing the most of our potential is when you have great leadership capacity that's actually already matured and ready to be released into the kingdom in your church. And they sit there dormant because we haven't taken the extra step to let them know we want them to lead. Okay. So if I hear you correctly, obviously two guys who have been pastors um, and, and the thing that I just heard from you is that, and we have some fantastic uh, women in ministry at our churches, but I know that there's more untapped potential. And I know that a lot of them have come from the same background that you've come from a uh, pretty conservative background. So I unless we articulate that as a leader, they're kind of on standby waiting for us for the invitation. Is that what I I'm hearing? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would say the better the leader, the, the woman who's going to be the most effective and the best person to work with is the most hesitant unless yes. you approach it. 
Mm -hmm. That's so true. And that's, that's actually for guys and girls, by the way, the people yes. that come running up to me right away <laughs> and say, I want to lead this ministry. Like those are the people that kind of uh, scare not. me a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so Rightly I, so. Yes. I, I champion women in leadership. I don't think every woman should be in leadership, just like I don't think every man should be in leadership. We're looking right. for the right people, yeah. right. but a lot of times the right people are sitting there and we just haven't seen them in that capacity yeah. and they've held back showing it to us, but it doesn't mean that it's not our job to steward those leadership gifts to their maximum impact for what God has called us to. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So Katie, your book, uh, Developing Female Leaders, Navigate the Minefields and Release the Potential of Women in Your Church, um, is is uh, the book you're referencing, an incredible book. So let's say, let's say the theology and the practice, let's say someone's listening, they're on board with it. Um, they're also being as articulate as they can be or feel like they're inviting women into it. And, and they're still, for whatever reason, uh, haven't broken the barrier, the hesitancy is still there, it's not happening. What, what, how would you coach or train that uh, leader to uh, what ne what next steps um, mm -hmm. can we can we do to encourage it even more if if the hesitation mm -hmm. doesn't break at that. Mm -hmm. So I think this is actually a key question that we can do, whether we're a formal leader or we're really coming at it as a member of the church or even someone who's just trying to understand how God works in his body, would be to ask a couple key questions. And one of them is, what is it like to be a female leader here? Mm -hmm. Like help me understand. And the key with this is we really have to take off our own uh, filters, the way we listen to answers, because we all have very different experiences. And I would say, if you're not a woman of her race and age, it's going to be really easy to uh, listen to her words and make really wrong assumptions. But even if you are very much like her, try to listen to her actual story and the impact that's had on her. Um, because uh, it's hard to describe the impact of culture and unintentional messages to someone who's not really open to listening to them. They're unintentional because we don't realize we're saying them. And so you're looking for clues that you are saying something or be leading in a way or making decisions that are sending a message that you don't intend to send. Uh, if you think about this with parenting, we do this all the time, right? Our kid comes in after school and they're really hungry and we're like, give me a minute. I'm, I'm finishing up something and, I'm, and whatever. And they feel like they can't ever ask for a snack again, right? It's right, right there. Yeah. That was not the intended message. I just needed a minute to finish up yeah. this phone call or put the groceries away before I did whatever. But a little kid takes this unintended message and like goes years without getting a good afternoon snack because they never <laughs> want to ask for it again, right? We do this all the time because we have power and we have yeah. influence and we have authority. Mm -hmm. And so as uh, folks that carry authority. And for a lot of people, we have amazing blessings from God, or if we're mature in our faith, we carry an authority that's different than someone who's new to the faith or wondering if they have a calling or a place in ministry. So when we ask the question and we really listen to the answer, it helps expand our mind to understand things from another's perspective. Mm -hmm. And then we can use whatever influence and authority we have to adjust the messages to make sure we're being more accurate. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I'm having the opposite problem though with my kids and afternoon snacks. It's not that they're not getting one, they're getting too many. So many. And so, uh, <laughs> we just recently, this week, yeah. actually bought locks yeah. uh, for our fridge and our pantry. I saw it. It almost looks like a prison. <laughs> I stayed at this because, house last night. Because our kids are eating so many snacks, they're not yeah. eating dinner then. And the problem though is mm -hmm. it's a number code. Yeah. And like after you it. open it, you have to unscramble the number code. So my kids are finding the code. What every is day. The code? They're still getting in. I was anyway. trying to get. Yeah. I, I'm staying, Were you hungry? You needed a snack, did you? I'm staying, I'm staying at Zach's house. He invited me because I, I live in Florida. And I go downstairs after he goes to bed. And I noticed that all the snack cabinets Locked have... Off. Yeah, like it's a prison or something. And so then I did what any 48-year-old would do. I started working the numbers I thought that... <laughs> Zach would use, right? And so three o'clock, I went to bed just starving. At that <laughs> Katie, you got to help me. I, that, please tell my wife to tell me the code. If you're listening, Allison, I want, I want in. <laughs> you um, don't know the code. I, I do. Oh, okay. but, um, oh. No, I think that's great. So, so we can, we can get the theology, the practice. Let's articulate it. Let's listen to stories. Let's understand. Here's what I love about your story too, though, is I think you then go beyond that 
it, with with your practice, uh, being a part of a, a large church, uh, I think the, another step beyond that that you did was we're not just going to talk about it and articulate it. Mm-hmm. We're going to provide you an opportunity. Uh, I saw that in, when you were at the church in Florida, you started a leadership academy. And so I think mm-hmm. that that's a, a step, right? So we're not just going to articulate. We're going to go ahead and provide you a platform and a space to do that. Talk us through that piece. I, I want to know how you came up with the Leadership Academy and and if that's something wise that a lot of churches ought to be doing to give uh, not just women, but men as well, opportunities then to not talk about things, but actually step into things. And uh, mm-hmm. to add on to that, will you do that at my church in Orlando? <laughs> Absolutely. Give me a call. We will set up a good leadership go. school for you. Right, uh, yeah, for me, that uh, the leadership school we built was really strategic. At the time I was executive director over multi-site. So I oversaw our nine campuses and we were trying to launch more campuses. We were in the middle of a senior pastor transition. There were a lot of moving parts and pieces. I was responsible for a lot of those things coming to fruition. And we had a lot of the things we needed to uh, make all that happen. But what we were missing was enough really qualified, trusted leaders. Mm -hmm. We had people who wanted to be leaders. We had people who had been leading, but the bigger you get, and especially when you do higher level leadership transitions, Uh, we lose some kind of relational trust that we have a lot of times in church, which is like, I've known this guy since seventh grade, or they came in their 20s and now he's 45, right? You've watched them for 20 years. It's easy to entrust people when you've known them a long time. And we were really had to shift from being an organic leadership church to a uh, systematic uh, process that created organic leadership development. So I didn't want to give up the organic piece. It's part of how church family functions best. It's also how you develop disciples and leadership the best is through organic relationships. But we needed to systematize the ways those were created and the outcomes of how we measured it. So the leadership school was my solution to that. And it did help me sort of um, uh kind of take a lot of birds with one stone, so so to speak. So when we recruited people for the school, I could make sure our ratios around gender, around race, around age were what we wanted our church to look like in a few years. It wasn't based on what our church looked like at the moment. And there's something amazing when you take leaders, people who have been walking with the Lord a long time, who have a lot of experience, who are already proven leaders in other capacities. Again, this is a leadership bucket conversation, not a discipleship bucket. So not everyone is invited to be a part of yeah. the school. We turned down some applicants. You Chris had to pay a yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah, I wouldn't show up in your sequence suit to the <laughs> leadership uh interview that I had. Um so there. we it costs a lot of money. We require homework. You will be graded. Never We're much. actually treating it more like a West Point than oh. maybe a membership class where wow. we're trying to recruit people and we want our numbers up. I was looking to eliminate people I couldn't trust to lead a campus. Because wow. wow. when you do multi-site, you've got geographical distance. We were starting to get yeah. beyond that 10 to 20 minute range of drive range where you really don't know what some, what's happening. And we needed culture carriers. We needed people who were biblically sound. We needed people knew, who knew how to uh, pastor people with a good shepherd's heart, you know, a strong yeah. rod and a loving hand. Yeah. And those things are not easy to uh, measure from a distance. And so our leadership school... Uh, We designed a curriculum that really tried to create the kind of leader we needed to trust to send away. And then uh, we put them in a room together so we could create a leadership community. So when they were on a campus, we took a few graduates with them. We did a small group model. So we often launched campuses based around who was at the table. We formed the cohorts on who was going to be our next campus launch. So we spent 18 months with them. We got rid of the people who weren't going to make the cut. Sometimes you really can't predict who can't uh, stand up under pressure. And uh, so we try to be the furnace for that. And then when we send them, we have full confidence in who they are and how they're going to run uh, for the kingdom with our church expression. You basically awesome. created your own church planting school. And you created the, <laughs> it's the farm the, league. <laughs> the, the, the Princeton of, uh, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Okay. So, Let's take a step back. You were at, you served at a church in Florida. Where was that? That saw incredible growth. Yeah, I was Christ Fellowship Church in uh, Palm Beach Gardens. Mm -hmm. Palm Beach Gardens, nice place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So we have a lot of church leaders who are listening to us. So let's, let's, you served at a church that went from 3,500 to 23,000. Is that correct? (laughs) 
age. That okay. is correct. So what's They're bigger what, now. That, that was just when I was in that role. Yep. So I serve at a church that's not quite 23,000. Um, <laughs> can you give me one simple thing to grow my church by 19,500 people? Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, I do think that one of the things I love most about our church um, and the things that are important to me is we all grew up, those of us in leadership, especially in the early days, we all grew up in very small churches, yeah, like less than maybe 150. Yeah. And so there was a heartbeat and a servanthood and a um, commitment to relationship, healthy relationship with each other. That really is the foundation that allows you to grow like that. Awesome. I think uh, practicing integrity more than growth. I, none of us, I wasn't a part of the original, original group. I came in at about 3,500, but uh, the heartbeat of not caring about the numbers, like it, it took me five years to have anyone actually track attendance because we didn't want to get caught up in the wrong thing. So that kind of a integrity before the Lord of wanting to simply be faithful. And there's beautiful stories in the early days, the first eight to 10 years of the church where there was no growth and it was really working out the character issues in our lead family. And mm. to hear them talk about that and uh, the lessons they learned and how God orchestrated um, the, the, the sanctification of their heart as a leader. I just, I wow. think we can't underestimate what it means to be faithful and satisfied yeah. with whatever calling God brings us to. He's not looking for success. He's looking for faithfulness. Yeah. So that's not, that is my one answer, but it doesn't guarantee growth. It guarantees uh, success in the king, like long-term eternal significance. It doesn't guarantee anything else. Well no, said, but well but in, in the level of integrity, is it okay for us then to put a title on this episode of the one step to grow your church by 19,000? <laughs> people. Yeah, that's definitely the brand I'm going for is get quick, I mean, you know, real, rich quick, how you go up and to the right in your church strategy. I am all about that. That's awesome. <laughs> Katie, hey, I know you're actually helping our current church right now here in Omaha, King of Kings, uh, be thinking about our long term strategy, our multi multi site strategy. And, and I'm so excited about what God's doing and excited about that and having you in and getting your voice into that. Uh, when it comes to, I, I'm curious though, uh, when it comes to discipleship, um, there are a lot of existing churches and then there are church plants, there are multi-site churches. Um, is discipleship easier or harder in um, any of those contexts? Like what have you seen? Is it is it easier or harder in an existing church or a new campus or site? So I'll bring us full circle to the potluck experience we had earlier, which is... <laughs> The further away a new person is from a mature leader, the harder discipleship is. The Say more that, proximity. I'm sorry, I missed that. Say that again. Yeah, the further away a new uh, disciple or a new believer is to a mature leader, the harder discipleship is. The closer wow. the proximity, the the better it goes, the more spiritual growth you will see. It's just yeah. kind of common sense, but a lot of times in our church growth um, strategies, we don't think of it that way. So the way I see that play out in um, multi-site and church planting is we tend to see the most converts and the most spiritual growth in our new campuses and new church plants. But the reason is you have an entrepreneurial spiritual leader who loves the Lord and has given his life to plant something. And yeah. he is personal, he and she, they're personally involved in the lives of every new person who comes in. Mm. As we grow, we start wanting to reach the Guinness Book of World Records through other people, yeah. and it's not the same. That's and correct. so it's not really an issue of church strategy. It's an issue of how am I multiplying myself, not as a leader organizationally, mm. but as a spiritual leader, disciple maker. And we tend to break down a lot on that because most of us uh, then come on staff and then it's about numbers and it's about programs and it's about things we talk about at conferences. It's not about actually making and growing disciples. That life on life discipleship. That's, that's so, so that's so good. So the danger for long time or existing churches, especially ones that are growing, mm -hmm. I would say is how do you stay in that life on life discipleship, not just as pastors and churches, but the whole church, right? Because I love that. The closer you are to the proximity, the the, the better op opportunities for someone to grow mm -hmm. as a disciple. That's so good. Well, and the bigger you get as a church, especially if you've been evangelistically oriented, mm -hmm. the lower the ratio of mature believer to new believer. And we want that. We just haven't been good at actually strategizing around that. 
It's good. Uh, one of the one of the big populations I think is underdeveloped and underchallenged is transfer growth. It it has a bad name when you're starting campuses and church plants, and we aren't building churches to take people from other churches. But when you get an influx of mature believers, if you are not unleashing them to new believers in discipleship, if you're hiring them, if you're putting them in charge of the parking lot, you are missing the opportunity of who God has brought you to shepherd the new baby lambs. Mm. I love that. Yeah, I really wrestled with that when I planted a church back in the day. And it it was a lot of people from other church. And I was like, I don't want to make a church for other. But it, I think where I, I came to peace with it is there are seasons for people and seasons for church. And God will give you the people you need in the season that you're in right now. And some of those people will stay with you forever. And some of those will go to a new season somewhere else. Yeah. But uh, the key is like always engaging and giving people opportunity to step more fully into discipleship. And, and, and I really had to wrestle with that, but uh, probably a couple years into it, I was like, you know what, God's sending them here for a reason. Um, they need something here that we offer. And so let's give them a place to serve as a disciple. Let's be the people God's called us to be. And it was really cool to uh, just watch. And I see, and I hear through you, like the more we articulate and invite and then set up environments for people uh, to thrive is in discipleship and in leadership. Like that's what this podcast is all about. We want to, yes, let's do this. And, and how many things and people don't realize their potential uh, because we just didn't ask and we just right. didn't challenge. And so, well, and we didn't train. This is where a leadership school or some program, because uh, as people yeah. mature in Christ, they need less uh, participant programs. They need less structure. They need less um, like systems. They need more personal challenge and high accountability. And when you get a mature believer who shows up on your doorstep, what you don't need to do is give them a big chunk of stuff without any oversight. You actually need to give yeah. more challenge, more more oversight. And, and most believers, especially mature believers or leaders are longing to be led. What I find in um, most church plants and campus launches is we're a little, t we forget that we're trying to win the Guinness book of world records through people. We're trying to be the hero. And so we spend most of our time on the front line and we don't challenge and equip people to be on the front line and hold them accountable to it. Transfer growth is not easy. They bring baggage, they bring agendas, they're dissatisfied with you. They're probably going to move on in two years anyway, unless you actually disciple them well as the leader. And if you're the leader, you're the only one who can. Right. That's so funny that you bring that up. Before I became a pastor, I'm a second uh, career pastor. And before I had done some stuff in radio and TV, and then I got fired from all that. And then I started working at a cell phone company, a uh, Fortune 500 company. And what I noticed is that they would always take the best salesperson and promote them to manager. And it never made any sense because like what makes you a good salesperson does not make you a great manager. Yeah. And inevitably the manager would always fail. And they're like, I don't understand. He's so good at sales. Like it's such a different quality. And I see that in churches, you know, you see somebody who's very energetic and then they get, you know, you're, you're looking for 10 people to lead kids ministry. Nobody wants to do it as opposed to getting the person that might actually be gifted and inviting them into it. We just take the person who comes first, who's not equipped and might not even like kids like, <laughs> gosh. All right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That was Leadership is much more of a chess game than a checkers game. You can't just plug people in. You have to like know who they are, yeah. use them strategically and trust that the Lord's giving you the people you need today. And if you don't have the people, it's not time to launch whatever your idea is. It's That's one cool. of the ways you tell about God's timing is who he sends you. Amen. I love wow. it. All right, Katie, we uh, always challenge our guests with this final question. Mm. And then, uh, and then by the way, Chris wants to play a quick game with you on the way out. Uh, but the question we ask each guest is if you could challenge our audience, uh, one practical thing this week they can do to grow as a disciple in Jesus, what challenge would you issue? Mm, that is a great question. Uh, I coach a lot of leaders and in business and churches and but usually people of faith. And I think the one challenge that is pretty uh, synonymous with everyone is that they do not have enough flexibility in their quiet time. They mm -hmm. don't access the freedom of their relationship with God. And so most leaders are doing quiet times out of obligation and it feels unfruitful, but they're disciplined mm -hmm. or they've given up on it. And yeah. neither one is actually what that is intended. And so I encourage, especially if you've been walking the Lord with the 
for a while. If you're new to the faith, if you're reading through the Bible for the first time this year, like stick with the structured program. But if you've done that a few times, if you've kind of gone through the book of Proverbs one verse a month, you know, multiple times, if you've done some devotional books, if you've done the rounds and you kind of could write it yourself, you know who you are, then it's time to expand your experience with the Lord. Read other books, sit quietly, listen just to music, do journaling, um, read something that's more challenging, change the books up every day. Just uh, have the freedom of being in a mature relationship with God. It's like the, it's like any other relationship. And I think we don't talk about it very much in our uh, young oriented, like spiritually young oriented ministry strategies. So we don't encourage people on weekend to do things unstructured or in free form. But if you've been married for 40 years, you should not be doing, you know, 20 first dates with your spouse. You should be beyond that. Right. And so I think most leaders are so busy helping other people figure out their step. They're not challenging themselves to new, new, fresh, innovative things. And if it doesn't work, then try something else. You've got freedom and grace to find your new expression of connection with God. All right. So that I like that. That's the challenge this week is to find freedom and flexibility in your quiet time to truly connect with God. Mm -hmm. Hey, if that's you and you're doing that this week in whatever way, share. uh, Because I think I always love learning from others and what they're doing new. Um, Share social media and use the hashtag Red Letter Disciple. Uh, One thing I've done this year that kind of speaking to that that I've had a lot of fun with is the I've I've never actually read through the message version of the Bible. Um, And, you know, I've quoted it. I've looked up, you know, I heard different things. But this year I decided, you know, I would really want to read the message message just to see. And I tell you, it's, it's, it's just opened my eyes and I'm having fun Mm. and it's new. And I feel like I have to, yeah, along, alongside of you, I feel like I have to reinvent my quiet time many, many, many times and giving you permission and excuse to do that. It's fun. So I love that. The best question you asked is what do I want to do? Like, it really should be like, what sounds fun? What sounds like it would mean something? What would be cool to experience? That's your lead indicator of where you start looking. Yeah. And if I'm having like a hard week or whatever, like I don't have to force myself to read Leviticus. I can read like (laughs) Acts or Galatians. Yeah. It's still just like sit with your Bible. Yeah. Just like you can do around a Bible bingo every once in a while. It's not an undisciplined life. If you just say, God, I need something like we just don't want to get in a rut. I think that's the thing we want to avoid is getting stuck and uh, working out of obligation. I love it. All right, Mr. Chris Johnson, I'm going to turn it over to you. Katie, I'm always scared to do this. Uh, I apologize in advance. (laughs) I don't blame you. I'm a little scared myself. (laughs) All right, Katie, uh, we've known each other now for about 45 minutes. And (laughs) here's the thing. Uh, I realized that you, I read that you like to go thrifting. Is that true? That is very true. Hey, good, good. Thank goodness, or else this wouldn't work. <laughs> uh, I grew up in a family where my mom owned a few antique stores. So as a young lad, I would go around to different thrift stores, and she would try to find the jewel in the in the muck. And so, yes, did I dumpster dive? Sure. <laughs> uh, so Things like that. But this is what the game show is. Are you ready? This is what it is. I went to goodwill.org. And I got the national average for thrift items. And now what we're going to do is we're going to play a game and we're going to test your thrifting knowledge. These are the average prices in the entire United States for thrift and yard sale items. Okay. Okay. Now, wait a second. Goodwill and thrift stores have different price points in yard sales. So which is it? You caught me. You caught me. I'm sorry. (laughs) It's for goodwill. It's for goodwill. goodwill. Okay, a goodwill, a goodwill, because they, they, you know, those goodwills, man, they make some good money. So yeah, these are higher well, priced items. This, and, and, and her bio, by the way, it didn't just say I, she in, in, uh, loves Scrabble. It says intense Scrabble games. Yeah. So she's <laughs> like pretty intense with this stuff. All right, but. here we go. So here's the first item. You walk into a goodwill store anywhere in the United States. What is the average price? for women's jeans, and you need to come within $3. The average price of Goodwill women's jeans. I'm going to say $4. Oh, $5.99. That is correct. $5.99. Yes. Way to go. You're one for one. All right, here we go. Wait, did she win these prizes for yeah, you? Yeah, she, we, we, at the end. Am I getting all... a pair of Goodwill jeans? Is that what Absolutely. you're telling me? Absolutely. It's on the way right now as we speak. 
producer, uh, go to Goodwill. Here, well, let's see what you win first, you know, and then we'll send the whole thing. All right, let's get a little bit more tricky. Let's get a little bit more tricky. Let's go a men's coat, a men's winter coat at mm. Goodwill. Ooh. And you have I'm, to be with, wait, wait, you have to be within three dollars. This is gonna be hard because she lives in Florida. Yeah, I know. Okay, this is not a blazer, like a nope, suit blazer. Nope. We're talking winter coat. Winter coat. Twelve dollars. Nine ninety nine, ten dollars. That's correct. Okay. <laughs> All right, you're two for two. You are two for two. All right. Uh so let's... we're sending you a men's coat, apparently. You've won a men's <laughs> coat so far, and you've won women's jeans. <laughs> But here, let's go to a household item. How well do you know your household items? Within two dollars, a ninth, uh, an ant, or an old coffee mug. Within two dollars, you walk into a Goodwill. How much is a coffee mug? Three dollars. Oh, Forty-nine oh. cents. Forty-nine cents. Oh. oh. That is a for like deep- an antique coffee yeah. mug. Okay. Yeah. I'm going, I know where I'm going when I open my coffee shop, I'm going to Goodwill. All right. Well, let's, let's get you back on track. Let's get you back on track here. <laughs> this is fantastic. Nobody uses this anymore, but Goodwill is loaded with these items within a dollar. What does a VHS recording <sighs> cost at Goodwill? I'm saying a dollar 50. Oh, you know, she she got it. It was 50 cents. So you were there. You were. <laughs> Boom. Right on it. That's, okay, last one. Last one. Let's get the, this is the- You know, things one. are priced higher in Florida. I think I'm just not doing the national right. average correctly. So congratulations, <laughs> you win a VHS. Yes. Set. Okay, yes, this, perfect. This is the last item. This is this is within $5. Within $5. Oh, wow. This must be- Yeah. Feeling the pressure. Yeah. This- um, a comforter. Ooh, nasty. Comforter. Um, <laughs> That's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> uh, anywho, but a comforter. Mm-hmm. Within five dollars. Final, final question. I'm gonna say fifteen dollars. Let's see here. Ten dollars. You got it. She right won. Just barely. <laughs> yeah, no, you barely just, sneaking in $10. here. Ten dollars. A fantastic effort. I think you were uh, four for five. So I only lost on that dang coffee mug. I had way too high of expectations in my mindset of that one. Zach, let's see what we've learned today. Uh, Katie, expert <laughs> at Scrabble. Yeah. Expert at leadership and women uh, developing leaders. Yes. She knows her stuff around a thrift store. Yes. Potlucks, church Pot growth, I mean, everything. So. You really are the quintessential church nerd. You know that, right? <laughs> Abs- I absolutely know that. <laughs> you really are. And I love you for it. Hey, Katie, where can people go to find more about you? You've been a real blessing to us today. So where can they learn more? Oh, sure. The best place to catch me is on my website, Katie Cole, spelled K-A-D-I-C-O-L-E. And that's my social media handle also, at Katie Cole. On the website, there's tons of free resources and things about many of the things we talked about today. So if you're interested in more, check that out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katie. And uh, it's been awesome to be with you and enjoy that sunshine in Florida. Oh, uh, this was Thanks, great. guys. It's been yeah. really a joy and love that suit. Hope to see it, I'm sure, in Thanks many more so podcasts in the future. For yes. too, yes. so. yes. What is the price of a sequin jacket? Yeah, there you go. Yep. Take care. All right. Katie. Thanks, guys. I learned so much from Katie, and I was so impressed. Like, she was. We had some serious questions, but like she was also able to take our somewhat silly questions and turn them into really practical leadership tips and tools. Like that's awesome. She's an incredible woman. So if you want to connect with her and the things she talked about, get a sneak peek at her book that is already out, Developing Female Leaders, and access the show notes, head over to redletterpodcast.com for all of that. Well, earlier we heard that now could be just the perfect time for a capital campaign. So as you're considering your options, check out The Giving Church They are Christ-centered. They are kingdom-minded people to work with. And here's the deal. They've also got proven results. Those are the people I love working with most, the ones that love Jesus, but also like they've got the results. And so for our listeners, they are giving out a free PDF, five ways to grow your church's giving. You can grab that again at thegivingchurch.com slash red. 
Episode 8 is next week, and we've got none other than Rusty George. Rusty is the lead pastor of Real Life Church in beautiful Southern California. In addition to pastor, he's got a lot of other hats he wears, speaker, author, leader, and a teacher that makes real life simple. And I think that's why I love him so much, because I'm pretty simple. I think there's a lot of people out there that think discipleship should be deep, not simple. So I asked him about that. And then tragically, in 2019, Rusty had to lead Real Life Church and their family, after their family pastor, Jim Howard, committed suicide. I asked him, like, how in the world did you do this? And, and what he and others like us can learn from this and how we can better understand the mental health epi- epidemic in our world. In the wake of tragedies where it seems like they're continuing to come, where mental health issues abound, this is an important episode that you can't afford to miss. It's going to drop next Tuesday. And so the best way to make sure you get it is subscribe or follow on your favorite streaming platform. And I don't understand how technology works, but like it's just going to show up in your feed. So till next time, we'll see you next Tuesday. <laughs>